In this lecture, we're talking about output feedback control and observers. So we've talked about observers already. Uh, we looked a little bit at state feedback design and how we could use something like Ackerman's formula or place command to do state feedback to place poles where, where we want. We've seen that we can also create an observer for a system, and this involves getting an observer gain. And um, so if we have a stable observer, then the estimate of the state can converge to the actual state. And, and so now we're going to look at output feedback and model-based controllers in, in this lecture. So again, state feedback uses measurements of all the states for feedback. If the system is stabilizable, then we can stabilize it using state feedback. If the system is controllable, then we can arbitrarily place all the eigenvalues of the closed loop system. That's really, really great. It's important, uh, what's important is this obviously can handle unstable systems for if it's stabilizable or controllable. And it can also handle systems with right half plane zeros. And it's like, what difference does that make? Well, um, Right half plane zeros, so, so right half plane poles obviously make a system unstable. Right half plane zeros uh, make the control problem harder if you're using output feedback. Since we're not using output feedback, in this case we're using state feedback, then we would have the ability to d deal with those right half plane zeros and not, not be affected by them. In looking at output feedback control, we're going to look at basic, what I call basic output feedback control or static output feedback. Then we're going to look at dynamic output feedback. In the static output feedback problem, this is a particular form that we could use where we have a feedback gain and we may want to incorporate various properties by appropriate choice of K in this. So first of all, let's look at stability. If we have a closed loop system like this, n over d, if we look at the closed loop characteristic polynomial of this loop, this is the closed loop characteristic polynomial, d of s plus k n of s. And so we can see that the roots of the system are linear in k, and, and so they're a continuous function of k. So as k varies, the, the poles or the, the roots of this polynomial migrate along a path called the root locus and, and they move smoothly. So in other words, you can't just get for, for one value of k, you get this value, this set of poles, and then, and then for a slightly bigger value, they jump. Okay, so they don't, they don't jump. Um, although they can move rather quickly in some cases, um, but they don't jump. So an important question is, for what range of k would this system be stable? Another question is, for what range of k are the closed loop poles in desirable locations? So what do we mean by desirable locations? That's where we come back and we look at the issues of uh, robustness and, and performance systems. So let's let's look at an example here. Here I have this system trans with this transfer function. And this is the root locus. Here I'm actually showing it as as a um, as k varies, the poles migrate. Let's, let's see this again. So here we have the poles migrating. So this pole was unstable. It went stable. And now these poles have gone unstable. They were stable and they've gone unstable. And so in a root locus type situation, that's the kind of thing that can happen. So there's a range of K in which this pole is on the left half plane, and these other poles are still in the, in the left half plane. But if you continue to increase k, then eventually they um, cr 
cross over into the right half plane. Okay, so here is a function. Recall that if you have a, a function, this function has two zeros. It has a zero obviously at s is equal to minus one, but it also has another zero. The other zero is where? Hmm. Well, if we take the limit as s goes to infinity of this transfer function, we will find that it goes to zero. So what that means is that there is a zero out at infinity. And you can actually uh, find out where that inf zero where that zero is specifically. So in terms of the problem we've talked about, adjusting k to migrate the closed loop poles, the, we can get what's called the locus plot. And here are the rules, the tools, and what's cool about the root locus plot. So the, the root locus plot tells you the number of branches uh, of, of the roots, the initial points of the root locus, the final points. So when k is equal to 0, where, where, are, the, where are the roots? As k goes to infinity, where are, you know, where, where are the roots? Um, and there are some symmetry properties. Um, we can talk about when do we have real roots. We can talk about something called breakaway or break in points. We can talk about asymptote, uh, the intersection, and that is the centroid of the asymptotes. We can talk, talk about asymptote angles. So when we talked about uh, as s goes to infinity, we saw that that function went to zero. Um, and so Infinity basically is approached asymptotically, and so the asymptote has a centroid, a place where it starts, and an angle, and that's that's one way of defining uh, where you know where that pole at infinity is, or the root at infinity. When do we get imaginary roots? Um, the root locus direction. So as the pole varies, as k increases we can um, the root locus tells us these things and also calculation of k if you look at, at the root locus plot we can find out specific values of k at which uh, things things occur so here is an example polynomial and it's a function of k as we vary k what happens well so this is the process of root locus and in ee 314 we talk about root locus so I'm not going to go through all the rules and how it all works but NATLAB has a root locus tool that can be used for this so when k is equal to 0 the roots of this polynomial are the roots of this part this is like the denominator these are the poles so here are the initial four poles and since there are four poles there are ultimately four zeros and basically what happens is the root locus goes from the poles to the zero starts at the poles and goes to the, the zeros so for example when k is very large this part of the polynomial dominates this part of the polynomial so this part is almost insignificant and this part is the part that becomes significant so that as k goes to infinity it's the zeros that play an important role so here are some, here are the poles initially the, the x's and uh, the zero and we also have since we have four poles we also have four zeros so since we only have one finite zero that means we have three zeros at infinity and so we can see this one heading off to infinity that way these these two coming together heading off to infinity that way and that way okay and then we have one of the poles heading off to this zero finite zero so zero, so O's are zeros, X's are poles. These are not hugs and kisses. Do not confuse them. All right, you can ha you can have some pretty serious ramifications otherwise. Okay, um, okay. So this is the root locus plot for this particular set of poles and zeros. And now we ask the question: Can this system be stabilized? That is, for some value of k, 
it, are all the roots in the right half plane? Uh, I'm sorry, the left half plane. Can the system be stabilized? So we look at the system and we can see that these two guys are in the right half plane. They come together, they break away at this point. One pole heads off that way, deeper into the right half plane. This one heads off this way, deeper into the right half plane. And so these poles never cross over into the left half plane. So by looking at the root locus plot, we can tell that the system can be stabilized using static state feedback. And in this case, it cannot. It cannot. So this is a nice tool. And uh, this is uh, something that we can use for output feedback. For static output feedback, in the multi-input, multi-output case, we, again, we have a state model that looks like this. We're going to use as a control k times y. And when we do, this is the system that we get. Notice that we don't have an input in this case. Um, but that's OK. We just want to check for stability. Under what conditions, for what values of k, will this be stable? Well, we can apply Lyapunov theory. And we can see that the matrix A plus B k will be stable if and only if there is a positive definite p such that this uh, Lyapunov inequality holds. Okay, so this then is going to be the um, the derivative of the the Lyapunov function along the system trajectory is going to give you this, and so we need to we need to have this. So this is a uh, this is like a linear matrix inequality in that you have something transpose p p times something, but in this case we have both p being unknown and k being unknown. This leads us to what is called a bilinear matrix inequality, um, which is definitely harder to solve than a linear matrix inequality. A linear matrix inequality, we can always find uh, a solution, uh, or al almost always find a solution. But a bilinear matrix inequality, maybe not. Maybe not. So here's a theorem that we have for the static output, multi-input, multi-output problem. There exists a gain, a gain k such that the matrix A plus BK is stable. That is, it has all its eigenvalues in the left half plane. If and only if there exists a P positive definite that satisfies these two linear matrix inequalities. Ah, linear matrix inequalities. These can be satisfied. So B, B perp is actually the orthogonal complement of the matrix B. So the orthogonal complement is, de is defined. This is a full rank matrix such that when I multiply B on the left by this matrix, I get 0. Similarly, and so here is, here is its transpose. C complement is similar in that, um, in this case, C complement would be a full rank matrix such that when I multiply C by C complement, we get 0. OK, so that's what these complements are all about. And so notice I have this and its transpose, this and its transpose, and then I have this linear, this uh, Lyapunov type thing in the middle. Notice that this, in this case, I have P. In this case, I have P inverse. So in, in this case, I have simultaneous linear matrix inequalities, but they are dependent on the same variable P and P inverse. Uh, again, difficult to solve, just like the bilinear matrix inequality. Difficult to solve. Uh, in fact, there, there's, no, there's no known algorithm that will solve every possible case. So there are certain algorithms that will work in certain cases, but um, there's no known algorithm that will work in every case. But this is the static output feedback problem in the multi-input, multi-output ca case. So basically, it's unsolved. There is no exact solution to the static output feedback problem. There are, there are lots of uh, people have tried. Um, but just, just as we've seen with, um, with the root locus problem, um, the, the, for, for k, as you vary k, it can go stable or unstable. And so you, you have that kind of thing that can happen. Um, so anyway, it, it's a difficult to solve problem. So this is the uh, static output feedback problem for multi-input, multi-output case.